For anyone who doesn't know me, I'm the vice president of the Lake Coming Audubon Society. And this is a program about the raptors that we have in the local area. So I want to start off by talking a little bit about what are some of the, the special highlights for me in terms of raptor experiences I've had locally. And the reason I want to talk about this is a lot of times we watch nature documentaries or in school we think of nature as something you travel across the globe to do. You go to Africa, you go to Costa Rica, you go to Hawaii. But there's really a lot of amazing things that we can see locally. So I just wanted to name a few. And we also, i, I got to talk about them because that's the description paragraph I wrote up for this program. I have to explain them. So last May, it was May 2nd. I know this because I broke my camera on May 1st, so I didn't get any pictures. But I was down on Mill Street in Montoursville, and it was a real foggy day. It was one of those days where the sun shines through and burns off the fog in the early afternoon. And I, I was burning, I turned around and looked, and the sky was filled with hawks. It looked like, if you've ever seen Veracruz, Mexico, their hawk watch there, that's what this looked like. And I estimated about a thousand broad-winged hawks, 20 ospreys, there was a peregrine, there was ring-billed gulls, just tons of birds. Okay, next one, 27 golden eagles in a single day. Past couple years we've been hawk watching up at the Route 15 Overlook, it looks down on the airport. This past fall we had 27 goldens in a day. The year before, we had 100 red tails go by in a day. A few months ago, we, had a, we were on Mill Hill Road, which is sort of the secret short-eared owl spot in the county, and we saw a great horned owl come and steal prey from a short-eared owl. While hawk watching on a windy day, I've had sharp shinned hawks come within 10 feet of me. Uh, just this past weekend, and this photo here is from then, there were three bald eagles fighting over a fish up at Rose Valley Lake. And we weren't even there to look at the falcons. We had gone up to see a swan, and we just happened. Within 10 minutes of us pulling in, eagles started fighting over a fish. And of course, in Williamsport, we have the peregrine falcons, <coughs> the fastest animal on the planet. So when they stoop on a falcon, or when they stoop on a pigeon, it's pretty amazing. So for identifying raptors, and that's mainly what this program is going to be about, how to find them, how to identify them. I'm a birder. It's what I do. Um, so I'm going to come from a practical perspective. Where do you go to see these? How do you identify them when you see them? And so we're going to talk about the species, when and where, and what gear you need. So when we talk about raptors, we're specifically talking about hawks, eagles, falcons, and owls. And I'm also going to mention vultures, even though they're not raptors. They're close enough. They're counted when hawk watching. So this is a bar chart from the website eBird, and eBird is a citizen science project where people like you and me can go out birding and keep a checklist and submit it. So all of, all of the data here is generated just from users who submit to that. But what I want to talk about here is what time of year different raptors are around. We have ones like the red-tailed hawk that are around year-round. Same thing with bald eagles. But if we look at broadwing hawk, they're not around in the wintertime. They'll be showing up here in another couple weeks, and they'll be staying until October. There are other things, like the osprey, just starting to show up. We sporadically see them through the summer. Possibly they might nest in the county. And then we see them again on fall migration, but we don't see them in the winter. The golden eagle is kind of the reverse of that. We see them in fall migration, then throughout the winter, in spring migration, but we never see them in the summer. So each species has its own time frame of when it's around and for when you can, if, if you know when it's going to be around, you can specifically go out looking for it. I want to talk about what hawk watching is because I think some people might not know. The way I define it is hawk watching is being stationary at a location and watching the skies for migrating raptors. So you might have heard of places like Hawk Mountain, probably the most famous hawk watch in Pennsylvania. Wagoner's Gap is another one. We have a couple sites in the county that we do it. In the fall, we go to the Route 15 Overlook, and that's this photo here. It's from up there. And then we also have a site we call North White Deer Ridge Hawk Watch, which is up on Skyline Drive with the power line cut. And that's good in the fall and the spring. Um, but it's maybe not as good as Hawk Mountain in terms of the pure numbers sometimes. But like I said, we had 27 golden eagles in a day. That tied any other hawk watch in the state this fall. So you don't have to drive two, uh, two, three hours to go hawk watching. We have these local sites. And even just the past couple weeks, just going into my backyard in Montoursville so looking up, there's stuff migrating over. So don't think of raptors as something you have to drive to a hawk watch to see. Okay, getting 
getting started with identifying raptors, I think a lot of people focus on plumage traits first. They think of colors and the patterns of the bird, but there's a lot more that goes into identifying raptors, especially from a distance. The more distant the bird is, the less you're relying on those sorts of traits, and the more you rely on things like shape. So if we look at the sharp shinned hawk here, the wingtips are more rounded rather than pointed, like a falcon might be. It's got a relatively long tail. So just looking at the overall shape lets us know that it's, it's in the occipiter genus. Um, the size of the bird, you can get a sense of that by how, how quickly it flaps, and also by how long, if you have a bird that's circling, if you think of a small bird like a sharp shinned hawk, it might only take two seconds to circle. If you have a bald eagle, it's going to take 15 seconds to circle. So when you're looking at a very distant bird, you can use that. And as you get into the more advanced hawk watching and really identifying things from a distance, and they're real good guys, a lot of what they're going on is just subtle traits of the flight style of the bird, just little unique characteristics in the way it flaps and the way it moves, how often is it flapping versus gliding. You just pick up on these through experience. And of course, plumage is important as well. Um, here's an example of a red-shouldered hawk. And it's, it's a distant photo. It's not the greatest photo in the world. But here we can see the translucent crescent near the wingtip. We know it's a red-shouldered hawk because of that. None of our other hawks show that. So simply by knowing, by getting the experience with the different species and knowing what little things to look for, you can identify birds from quite far away. The first set of birds I want to talk about is the Buteos. And when we're talking Buteo, that's the genus name. So if you think of how animals are grouped, you have species. The next grouping up is genus. So a genus is just a group of closely related species. We have four Buteos, red-tailed hawk, red-shouldered hawk, broad-winged hawk, and rough-legged hawk. So if we start off with the red-tailed hawk, this is one of our most common species. This is the one you see when you're driving down the highway, perched on either in trees or on top of light posts. And if you've ever heard when identifying sparrows, people tell you to learn the song sparrow well. And then when you see another sparrow, you can say, okay, why isn't that a song sparrow? The same idea applies with hawks and raptors in general with red-tailed hawks. If you get to know the shape of the red-tailed hawk, then when you see a hawk, you can say, okay, I don't think that's a red tail. The tail looks too long. The wings look too pointed. It just gives you a way to start comparing things in that way. Now, the red-tailed hawk on the left is an adult and the one on the right is a juvenile. <laughs> so when we're talking about how to identify red tails, there's a couple of main things we're looking for. One is the belly band. You often hear red-tailed hawks have a belly band. So here you can see it on the juvenile. The upper breast is clean, the lower belly is clean, but here in the middle it has some black um, speckling, which they call the belly band. Another thing is the dark patagial bars. And this is a really important one. So if you look in the shoulder area, it's dark. It's got these dark lines. Red tails are our only raptor that really show that. So if, if you see a bird that you think is a red tail, if it has that, it is. If it doesn't have it, it's not a red tail. A couple other things to look at with uh, beauties in general. The tail is somewhat long, but not all that long like an occipiter might be. The wingtips are somewhat rounded. Uh, the difference between adult and juvenile red tails, the juvenile red tail doesn't have a red tail. So there's a lot of birds where they have something in the name, but it doesn't apply to all ages. So that's an example of that. Uh, one other thing for looking at adult versus juvenile, adults have a dark trailing line at the, the um, trailing edge of their wing that juveniles don't have. Here's a classic adult red tail hawk you might see perched somewhere. Again, you can see the belly band. Here's a juvenile. Again, shows the belly band. If you look at the tail from the top side, you can really see how it's more brown with thin streaking. Also, juveniles, they have, if you see, there's almost like a two-toned wing. The inner primaries here form a pale window. And that's something, if from a distance you see a red-tailed hawk, if you see a pale window like that, you can say it's a juvenile. So there's lots of little tidbits that you learn over time of how to identify and age these birds. <laughs> now one of my favorites, in the wintertime we get the northern subspecies of the red-tailed hawk, which is called the Abieticola subspecies, which means dweller of the firs. These are ones that nest up in Canada, 
and the main distinguishing thing is just how heavily marked they are. Look how big and dark that belly band is. The head is darker, it's like a dark red. It almost like bleeds down onto the upper breast. If you look at this different one in flight, again, just very heavily marked underneath. And we, we get them in the winter time, and then in the spring they migrate back up to Canada. Okay, the second beauty we're going to take a look at is the red-shouldered hawk. So this one on the left is an adult, and these two are juveniles. And we already talked about the pale crescent near the wingtip on red shoulders, and you can see that on all three of these birds. And again, red shoulder is the only one that shows that. Uh, we have red-shouldered hawks year-round. They're somewhat less common to see. Um, even while hawk watching, we don't get huge numbers of them. But it's certainly something you could even see near your yard. You might have them nesting near you. Um, and red shoulders have somewhat rounded wing tips, and that's something important when we looked at the um, broad-winged hawk, because we'll see that the broad-winged hawk has pointed wing tips. So like I said, the broad-winged hawk is somewhat similar to the red shoulder. Here's an adult up here, and these two are juveniles. Now broad wings, they're not back yet. They should be showing up in about two weeks, maybe. And they migrate in large kettles. They're the ones I was saying. I had a 1,000 of them at, at, at one time. Um, they nest in forested areas. Here's an example of a broad wing hawk kettle. So if you were to go through and count there, there's about 200 broad wings. And this was taken up at the Route 15 Overlook. And if you want to see something like this, mid-September is really the time to do it, the week of September 15th. If we go back for a second, um, for the overall shape of the broad wing hawk, the wings are a bit more pointed. There's only four feathers that make up the wing tip. One, two, three, four. So it's more pointed, whereas the red shoulder was more rounded. So here's a direct comparison. So these are the adult red shoulder versus broad wing. So the main things you're looking at are the wing tips. Again, red shoulder is more rounded and has the pale crescent. Broad wing is more pointed and doesn't have the pale crescent. And also the tail. If you look at the tail of the red shoulder, it's got these thin white lines, whereas the broad wing has one thick white band. And now the juveniles are extremely similar looking, but again, you want to be looking towards the wingtip. You can see that pale crescent and the more rounded wingtip, although the one feather is tucked in, so it's hard to tell. And the tail. The broad wing has thin banding and then one thick band. But perched, they're nearly identical, very difficult to identify. And the last, last beauty is the rough-legged hawk. And this is a bird that we only have in the wintertime, and it's somewhat scarce. Um, this year we started getting more of them just a, a few weeks ago or a month ago because there was a lot of snow up north. I think that pushed more of them down. But this is our only Budio that has two color morphs that we get. We get the dark morph, which you see up in the corners, and then the light morphs. This one looks somewhat dark, but it's actually a light morph. Um, the dark morphs have like completely black feathers. And these, these you usually see in farmland. And they're sexually dimorphic, which means the females look different from the males. Like this one's a male. This is probably a juvenile female. Okay, the next group we're going to talk about is the excipiters. So we have three of them, the sharp shinned hawk, the cooper's hawk, and the northern goss hawk. Um, excipiters are known for having long tails, and long wings for that matter. They're known for flying on flap, 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 glide. So if you see a hawk going and it's constantly gliding in between flapping, it could be an exhibitor. And these are the birds that if, if you see a hawk come in and steal a bird from your bird feeder, it's probably either a sharp-shinned hawk or a cooper's hawk. So let's look at the sharp-shinned hawk first. That's the smallest. Some of them are about the size of a blue jay on the small end. So here, these are both juveniles, and we know that from the vertical streaking on the breast. Sharp-shinned hawks and Cooper's hawks are one of the most difficult identification challenges, and people often ask how to do it. Um, the one thing you hear is that sharp-shinned hawks have squared off tails, and the reason for that is all of the tail feathers are approximately the same length, which we'll see for the Cooper's hawk is not the case. Other than that, just small head, small overall size, um, and we'll take a look at some other flight shots, too. Um, another thing to separate sharp shin from Cooper's hawk is sharp shinned hawks, they have blue on top of their head, but it also goes all the way down the back of their neck. Cooper's hawks have a light back of the neck. 
And I don't expect you to memorize all this stuff, by the way. <laughs> but just to give you an idea of, of what some of these are, <laughs> there, there won't be a quiz to get out the door. <laughs> And this, this bird here, you can tell it's just eight. It's got a full crop, so you can see it bulging out there. So the next one's the Cooper's Hawk. This is probably the most common hawk you might see in town, um, hanging around your bird feeders. I know we certainly see them a lot. Uh, we have them year-round. They're common in suburban areas. The one difference in flight, you can see Cooper's Hawks hold their wings very straight out. They don't push their wrists forward at all. Here's the juvenile Cooper's hawk, and I was talking about the tail feathers being short or being different lengths on the Cooper's hawk, and here you can see that. It's the outer tail feathers that are shorter, and when they fold their tail, those are the ones that are facing the camera. So you can see how the, the tail feathers are different lengths. That's a trait of the Cooper's hawk that the sharpshin does not have. Also, the streaking on this. This is a very typical streaking you might see on a Cooper's hawk. It's sort of teardrop shaped. It's not all that heavy. Especially down towards the bottom, it gets a little bit um, less thick. There's an example of a Cooper's Hawk flying with a bald eagle. This was down on Mill Street in Montoursville a couple years ago. Just to give you an idea of the size. So it's about the size of a bald eagle wing. I don't know why they were flying together. They weren't really fighting or anything. So they must not have seen each other as a threat. And here is a Cooper's hawk on the left versus a sharp-shinned hawk on the right. So this, this can give you a good idea of the differences between the two. So Cooper's hawk, large head versus the small head of the sharp-shinned hawk. Cooper's hawk holds the wings out straight, where the sharp-shinned hawk pushes the wrists forward a little bit. Gives the wings a bit of a curvy look to them. And again, the tail. Look at how the, the tail of the Cooper's hawk looks rounded, whereas the sharp-shinned hawk looks more squared off. And of course, the uh, sharpshin hawk is smaller. But it, it depends if you have males are smaller than females, so if you have a female sharpshin hawk, they can be nearly as big as a male Cooper's hawk. So for some of those in-between birds, it can be difficult to identify. But in this case, it was a good comparison. This was taken out at the Williamsport Water Authority. And our last goshawk, which is a lot less common to see, is the northern goshawk. Okay, they're very large. Um, these photos are courtesy of Wayne Lobsher, so thanks to Wayne for those. Um, adult goshawks have a, a very distinctive plumage, a white eyebrow, this, this very thin streaking on the breast. The juveniles, you can't see it too well, but they just have very heavy streaking. But goshawks are rare nesters in Pennsylvania. We probably have a few in the county, but it's, the nest locations are kept secret. But you don't really see them that much during migration either, so it's, it's, very, it, it's a treat every time you see one. Okay, let's move on to eagles. We have two species of eagles, the bald eagle and the golden eagle. Bald eagles are here year-round. Golden eagles are only here during migration and in small numbers in the winter. From a distance, the thing that characterizes eagles is they're big and they're dark. So, bald eagle, bald eagle, and golden eagle. And we'll take another look at all these photos. So, classic adult bald eagle. Everyone knows how to identify this one. Um, there's somewhere around, around 10 nests in the county, I think. I'm not sure of the exact number. But when you consider that in the early 1980s, there was only three bald eagle nests in all of Pennsylvania, and now there's about 300, it's, they've made quite a comeback. Um, and bald eagles are usually associated with water. So if you want to go see bald eagles, go up to Rose Valley Lake, go out to the river, and that's where you see them, because they eat fish. There's a perched one out on the river walk. I think this is actually the banded individual. There's, there's one that's banded that's the female of the local nesting pair, and I think that's her. If we take a look at young bald eagles, a lot of people might get them confused with golden eagles, but these are both bald eagles. It takes about five years for a bald eagle to get into its full adult plumage. And I want to talk about the terminology because sometimes people mess it up. Juvenile is only for birds that are in their first year. Um, the, the term juvenile means a bird in its first actual feathery plumage. And for bald eagles, that's one year. After that, when it's not quite an adult yet, you can call it a subadult. 
or you could lump the two together, juveniles and subadults, and call them immature. But again, juvenile just means the bird in its first year, which actually the bird on the right is a juvenile. David, this is wonderful, but my head's exploding. This bird on the left, when you have bald eagles with white stomachs, that's actually once in their second and third year. <coughs> then we have golden eagles, and the best way to see golden eagles is on migration. So that's October into November, and then this time of year. We actually just passed the peak of golden eagles, but it's not too late, you can still see some. The main thing that differentiates golden eagles from bald eagles is the shape. The head it just looks a little bit smaller, and also where the white is. So here's a comparison if you want to get really confused. So left one's a juvenile bald eagle, right one's a golden eagle. But take a look at where the white's at. Okay, on the bald eagle, there's white in the wing pit area. Golden eagles will never show that. You can think of it as on golden eagles, the white's a lot more well organized. It's here in the wings and here in the tail. It's not all splotchy around like on the bald eagles. And the, on these photos, it's hard to tell, but usually bald eagles are considered large-headed and golden eagles are considered small-headed. They're actually not that closely related. The bald eagle is a sea eagle and the golden eagle is a true eagle, so they're not in the same genus or anything. So that's, that accounts for the difference in the shape. Okay, here's one that... David, yes. excuse me. Yes. Maybe you could speak to uh, how remarkable it is these days that we have these golden eagles migrating here in the east. Yeah. Well, Tussie Mountain Hawk, which is really, I would say, the one place in Pennsylvania that started looking at the golden eagle migration in Pennsylvania in the spring, they started about 15 years ago with their count. And they discovered, that, I forget what, they averaged between 200 and 400 golden eagles each spring. And locally, we've, we've hawk watched in the spring and fall and discovered that there's a lot of golden eagles migrating through our ridges as well. Like I said, the Route 15 Overlook, a place you can see tons of them. Is that what you were? Yeah, it used to be golden eagles were western birds. You know, you went to Wyoming to see yeah. you know, golden yeah, eagles. There certainly are western populations of golden yeah. eagles. But lo and behold, there's this little eastern population. And there's a bit, I think there's a difference in habitat. Out there, I think they're more in like open spaces. Here, when we get them in the wintertime, they're, they're down in the forest hunting mammals. Okay, we have the osprey, which are just beginning to show up and they'll be around for a couple months. Here's an osprey that caught a fish at the river walk. Like I said, they're, they're occasionally might, less ne might nest locally. A couple years ago, one started building a nest out on um, the cell phone tower on the Golden Strip near Hosses. They, they ended up abandoning that, but they had started to nest. But most summers, we don't have any nesting ones locally. But we certainly get a lot of them in migration. And you see them catching fish up at Rose Valley Lake. Well, have you been up to Hammond Lake or Tioga Lake at all? No, but I'm sure there's a lot up there. Yes, yeah, that's where we're up. Uh -huh. That's where I go fishing. Uh -huh. So they have nests up there. And you see them in the summer. I see them as Who catches fish. more fish, you or them? They do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's usually how it goes. Yeah, we see them do it. Yeah. You sort of want to throw your pole in the water. Yeah, it makes you mad. Yeah. 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 And then here's one, here's how they dive into the water. If you've ever seen an eagle hunt, they just kind of go low on the water and grab. The ospreys, they go up high and dive into the water. Uh, I think the one thing that's neat is how close they get their head right behind their talons, like they're really zooming in on that fish. Have you ever seen one take a large fish and they couldn't take it out of the water? Uh, I've seen videos where they, oh, they got to oh, swim with them. Oh, but him, yes. Uh -huh. We saw this creature swimming across the water. Yeah. Once we got close to it, we realized it was, it was an osprey. Yeah. And it caught a big fish, and it was trying to get it to the shore. Uh -huh. And when it got it to the shore, it started Yeah. Down. Yeah, it was interesting. But with ospreys, like, when they go all the way into the water, it can be tough to get back out. <laughs> so if we move on to falcons, we have three different species of falcons. The American kestrel up here, the merlin, and the peregrine. 
And when we think of falcons, we think of very fast birds. Again, the peregrine is the fastest animal on the planet. It can reach nearly 250 miles per hour. Um, and when you watch falcons, they get where they're going. They flap continuously and they go there fast. The kestrel is the smallest and it's kind of the wimpiest. <laughs> but you see them in you see them in farmland areas. Especially if you drive around farmland, you'll see them sitting up on wires and they go down and they grab little mice and stuff. Um, they're sexually dimorphic, so again, this is a male and the, this is a female. They're like more brownish overall. Um, but these there is even one hanging along the river walk, so they're not always just in farmland. But like I said, they like to hunt rodents and things like that. This was one that I was hawk watching up at the Route 15 Overlook, and there's, when you're up there, there's a tree right in front of you, and it came and it landed right on top of it. <laughs> so sometimes you get close encounters like that. The Merlin is probably the least well known of, of the falcons that we have. Um, and a couple years ago, we had a pair nest locally, and I think they had five young. But we actually see them more in the winter than we do in the breeding season. There's a lot that migrate down in winter in our area. Even in my neighborhood in Montoursville, we have one that we see quite a bit. And of course, the peregrine falcons. We have a nesting pair here in Williamsport. There's a nesting pair in Muncie, maybe in Montgomery. So there's different areas where we see them. Uh, these photos are from the Williamsport birds. So this is the current female, I believe. This is probably her too. Most of the photos are probably her. You can see this one has a pigeon. It's carrying back to the Market Street Bridge. And naturally they would nest on cliffs, but they've adapted to nesting on bridges. And most of the time we see them catching pigeons. They could also catch like woodpeckers and birds about that size. So some more photos, some top side shots. Um, this one is from the Muncie pair when they did the banding. This is another Williamsport. This was just a couple weeks ago. A, a bald eagle made the mistake of coming into the peregrine's airspace, and the peregrine chased them off. So it's actually interesting. So this, this eagle was flying to the right in this photo, and the falcon came up from behind. And what the eagle did is it barrel rolled onto its back and then put its talons up to protect. Oh. Mm -hmm. wow. So that's what's going on there. And it didn't crash. No. Most of the time when you see raptors going at each other, they don't actually touch. Because it would be, you know, neither one wants to get hurt, they just want to chase them off. Here's the current female from that nesting pair when she was in juvenile plumage. So this would have been spring 2014. But that's the, the spring that she showed up and she's been around ever since. She's gone through a couple of males since then, but she's still around. <laughs> just like a woman. You know. <laughs> okay, now one that doesn't really fit into any of the major categories is the northern harrier. Yeah. This is another species that you see in farmland areas and fields with tall grass. This one down here, it's hard to see. It actually has some sort of prey with a long tail. I believe that's what's going on there. Again, sexually dimorphic. The males are called gray ghosts. So they're very silvery and gray overall, dark wingtips. The females and the juveniles are, are more brownish. Like this is a juvenile. The females look very similar to this with a bit more streaking. But this is one, if you're used to seeing them hunt over farm fields, the first time you see one go over to hawk watch and you see that shape, you're so confused. You think you have like something really good, and then it's just a harrier. So. <laughs> they are really good. Yeah. But you're thinking like Mississippi kite or something. So. Okay, and we, like I said, vultures aren't actually raptors, but they're counted at hawk watches. They're big. They hang out. On, they ride... They migrate in the same way that raptors do, so I want to discuss them. So we have two species, the black vulture and the turkey vulture. And vultures are known for being big, but they have small heads. So turkey vultures are probably the one that people are more familiar with. These are the ones that have always been around. This shape here is very characteristic of a turkey vulture. It's called a dihedral when they make that V shape with their wings and they, they wobble back and forth. They're very unstable in flight. So if you see a distant bird that's in a V shape, that's wobbling back and forth, it's a turkey vulture. <laughs> Whereas if you see an eagle from far away, they hold rock steady even in strong winds. Um, turkey vultures don't have any feathers on their head. That's one very distinguishing thing. 
And I've heard that's just because they eat carrion and stuff, so they don't want it to get stuff on them. And black vultures are a species that used to not really be around at all, but just in the past couple of years, the numbers have really picked up. So we're seeing more and more of them just really in the past two or three years. I can remember like just three or four years ago, to see them a couple times a year would have been special. Now, if you just go down near the landfill, they're everywhere. <laughs> and the shape is a bit different than the turkey vulture, so it's a bit more compact, a small triangular tail. So here's a direct comparison of the shape. Again, the black vulture has white wingtips versus if you look at where the turkey vulture has white, black vulture has very um, short, stubby wings. And when they flap, they have a real quick flap. The turkey vulture is more of a big, floppy flap. So again, it's just those little things you pick up on where you can see a black vulture from really far away and know just from the flap. Skip that and come back later. So we're going to move on to the owls now. We actually have eight species of owls. <laughs> so our smallest owl is the northern sawwood owl. And if you've ever seen those license plates that used to be around, and some people still have them, that had an owl on them, um, it was the sawwood owl. They're here year-round, but it's a species that's difficult to get. And these photos come from a banding we did at Wayne Lobster's farm. So there he is holding the owl. And what he's doing is he's checking the eye color. He has this, this eye color chart to see what, uh, what shade of yellow the eyes are. And down here, what he's doing is holding a UV light up to the wing. And you can actually tell which feathers are new and which ones are old based on what color they shine. And with owls, the one important thing is vocalizations. So I'm going to play the vocalizations of each of them for you. So the sawwood owl, there was a um, project to find them that was called toot root because they, they make a bit of a tooting sound. So. so that's what a northern sawwood owl sounds like. So if you've ever heard that. Okay, the next one is the eastern screech owl. One interesting thing is there's two different color morphs. There's the red ones and the gray ones. It has nothing to do with age or male or female. It's just some are one and some are the other. And then down here in this photo, that's just a young owl peeking out of a wood duck box. So it hasn't even left the nest yet. So of course, they are cavity nesters. And if you put up wood duck boxes, like we have wood duck boxes at some of the local wetlands, and we'll get screech owls nesting in them. In fact, when they cleaned them out this year, I heard that they had a screech owl in one of them, alive. <laughs> so. <laughs> so I'll play that. The call is often described as a, almost like a horse whinny. Some people can whistle that sound, and if you do it during the day, the, the, all, all the other birds go nuts. So <laughs> a good way to, to call in birds. Okay, next one is the short-eared owl, which I mentioned before. Um, we see these out on Mill Hill Road, a spot west of Williamsport. And this is probably one of the easiest owls to see because they're crepuscular, meaning they're not nocturnal, being out at night, but rather they're out at dawn and dusk. So if you go out in the late afternoon, you can see the harriers as they hunt the fields, and then as they start to go in, the short-eared owls come out. You can see this one here is carrying prey. And we only have these in the wintertime. They show up in about November and leave in March. And their flight is very moth-like, which is hard to, to explain beyond that. But it, if you see them fly, they fly quite different than the northern harrier does. And actually, the sound they make they, is more of like a barking or a meow. And you do hear them make that sound as they're hunting and fighting with each other. <coughs> it's definitely not the typical hoot that you might think of an owl making. <laughs> Okay, 
Okay, this next one is, is one of the rarer ones that we have. It's the long-eared owl. And again, these photos are from Wayne Lobsher. The easiest way to find long-eared owls, I guess, is what people do, because I've never found one. But they, if you look in thick conifer stands, you have to find them roosting during the day. But the problem is they blend in so well. So let me play the call of the long-eared owl, because they actually do have a bit of a hoot. So again, a very difficult bird to get. And when you find them, you sometimes find them roosting in groups. Next one's the barred owl, one of our more common owls. Um, the photo there of me holding one was actually one we caught when we were banding sawwood owls down at Wayne's place. Uh, it got caught in the net, and Wayne let us hold it. So this one was taken to Wayne's Port Water Authority. But they're another cavity nesting species. You can put up boxes for them to attract them. They like wooded areas. And the call is sometimes written as, who cooks for you? Or who cooks for you, who cooks for you all? <laughs> Just out hiking during the day, if you get close and startle them, sometimes they'll do that. David, I want to say about the barred owl, okay. do not make any owl calls near its neck. <laughs> okay. Because I read about they'll, they'll attack you right, yeah. right there, <laughs> right underneath its neck. Yeah, and, and they're, they're big owls, and they will go after saw wet owls and, and probably screech yeah. owls as well. Yeah. Okay, the great horned owl. Great horned owl. This is a very large owl, and again, it's, it's pretty common. And they like semi-open habitats, so they're not necessarily deep woods, but areas that are somewhat wooded, somewhat open. And sometimes their vocalization is written as, who's awake, me too. So this is the typical hooting that you could think of with an owl. So this photo was actually taken during the day. This was at a bird walk down at Montour Preserve, down in Montour County. And we just happened to come across it in a big um, stand of pine trees. Okay, the barn owl. These are some more photos that Wayne sent me from when they banded some barn owls. These are fairly difficult to get. You almost have to know a nest site, which is usually a farm where they're nesting in the, an old barn or in a silo or something like that. There's a few that we used to know about in the county. I'm not sure of any exact locations right now. But these definitely don't hoot. These have a bit of a screech to them. The screech owl doesn't screech, but the barn owl does. So this, is, this would be pretty scary to hear at night. which many of you might be familiar with from a couple winters ago when there was the biggest eru eruption year in history of them, including a number in Lycoming County. Um, these photos are from Wayne Lobsher. And this is this out here, I think both of these photos were the one that was up near up 15 near Fry's Turkey Ranch, hung out there for a couple weeks. These other ones, I'm not sure where he took those. But sometimes, this is almost a typical look that you might have of a snowy owl, just a distant white clump in a field. So when there's grass, on the, when, when you can see the grass, it's good. But imagine if there's snow on the ground. How hard is it to pick out one of those from a distance? And the snowy owl makes some sort of vocalization. I don't know. Actually, my app doesn't even have a vocalization for snowy owls, so I guess we're going to skip that. <laughs> so, but I don't think it's something you would hear very often anyway. Snowy owls are something, if you want to see them, you almost just drive around farmland looking for white clumps, and you spot like every trash bag and plastic bag, clump <laughs> of snow. 
So if, if you want to see owls or get them to respond, <coughs> you can go owling. Um, and the basic way you would do that is to go out into a wooded area at night, have your cell phone, maybe hook it up to a speaker. And typically, the species we do are sawwood owl, screech owl, barred owl, great horned owl. They're the ones you get in the woods. And you go from smallest to largest. Because if you play the large ones first, it scares away all the little ones. <laughs> so. um, another way you might look for owls is to look for pellets under trees and whitewash on trees. Or you can go to an owl banding. Wayne usually does them every fall out of this farm. He lives out near Block Haven in Clinton County. Dave? Yeah. When do they hunt? Do they hunt at night or during the day? or Which when do you Any of the owls. I, I always, always thought that they hunted at night and they yeah. had excellent night vision. And yeah, most of them are nocturnal. Like I said, the short-eared owls are more dusk and dawn. Um, the snowy owls were fairly active in the daytime when, when they were up here. But yeah, in general, that rule about owls being nocturnal holds true. You're not going to see them much during the day then? Yeah. Or? Although I know there's, I think barn owls might hunt during the day somewhat. I've seen a lot of videos from them hunting in the daytime. But your best bet is usually at night. So that's why the vocalizations are so important. Yeah. yeah. Chances are you won't see them at night, yeah. but you can hear them. Yeah. So just talking about general gear for, for looking at raptors. I mean, you want a pair of binoculars. There's a lot of information out there. 8 power and 10 power are the standard birding binoculars. Either one's fine. In fact, a lot of hawk watchers prefer less magnification, even down to 7 magnification, just because that gives you more of a field of view. So they want to be able, when they're scanning the sky for raptors, they want to have as big of a field of view as possible to spot the birds. Having that little extra bit of magnification isn't as important, especially when, when you're good and you're going off of the different, the way they're flying and the shape and things like that. Um, for a camera, like all the photos that are mine in here, which are all of them except Wayne's, I have a DSLR camera with a 400 millimeter lens. But you want a, at least a 300 millimeter lens. There's also a lot of good bridge cameras out there. The Canon SX50HS is a very popular birding one. That's one that a lot of people might have. And as far as spotting scopes go, um, they can be useful in hawk watching. Some of the, the real good hawk watchers say don't use them because then you're focusing on plumage too much. But if you do get a spotting scope, you get what you pay for. Good ones are expensive. And get yourself a good tripod. So don't just spend as much money as you can on the scope and then get a cheap tripod. Spend a couple hundred dollars, get a good tripod. And with raptors, you always have to take into account ethics and trying not to disturb them. Um, in particular, trying to get close for photographs. So with nesting raptors, there used to be a stigma against photographing nesting raptors. Now cameras are so easy to get, everyone's a photographer. Um, but you just want to, you don't want to get too close to a nest, is the bottom line. There's laws that you're not supposed to get within a certain distance. But just, just try to avoid it. Or like on the Facebook group the other day, there's someone posted a photo of someone standing along the highway on Route 15. Don't do that, that's dangerous. So. <laughs> Watch from a distance if you can, but don't try to approach a nest just to get photographs. Um, bumping is if you have a raptor on a pole or in trees, and you get close and it flies, and it lands in the next tree. So you approach it again, and then it flies again, and then you approach it again, and it flies again. Stuff like that you want to avoid just because you don't want to make the, the bird use too much energy. And it's got stuff to do. It's, it wants to rest. It needs to get food. So... In general, you know, yeah, we all sometimes we always sometimes get too close and the bird flies, but don't chase it the rest of the day. Um, baiting is a problem with owls. Sometimes a rare owl will show up and people will buy mice at a pet store and put it out trying to get the owl to come in to get that perfect photograph. Um, in general, that's frowned upon. Um, there's always big debates about it, but it's usually not a good thing. And along those lines, trespassing, if there's an owl in a field or something, you don't want to be trespassing. It yeah, I got bad. I got to tell you about the baiting. There was an article in the paper on uh -huh. it, but it said, see about baiting owls. Mm -hmm. They said, don't be doing that because sometimes when you put your fingers on that, like a rodent or the rodent about a couple of days old, it's not, it's going to make yeah, the owl The other sick. issue with it is they don't want 
the raptor to associate humans with food and get too close to roads, things like that, yeah. get hit by cars. Yeah. And uh, the use of playback. So we talked about owls going out owling and playing calls from your phone. Mm. You know, you can do it to a modest extent, but you don't want to go too overboard with it. So if we're talking about places to go to look at raptors, we already mentioned some. Rose Valley Lake is probably the best, especially if you want to see eagles. There's always eagles around up there, at least when the lake's open. So if you're trying to get photos of eagles or you just want to see them, Rose Valley Lake is probably the number one place I would recommend. Uh, the river walk is good. We see peregrines out there. We see bald eagles. We see cooper's hawks, red tails. So that's, with the lake, you know, everything's sort of concentrated over the lake. With the river walk, you have the whole stretch of river, so you don't always see eagles. But it's a good place to check out. I mentioned our two hawk watching sites at the Route 15 Overlook, which again is just on Route 15 looking down over the airport. North White Deer Ridge Hawk Watch, which is this photo here, just up on Skyline Drive. So you take Sulphur Springs Road out of South Williamsport up the Skyline Drive, and then just walk back to the power line cut. Um, Route 15 Overlook is good for hawk watching in the fall primarily because you're on the north side of the mountain. So you don't really have a view to the south, whereas up on White Deer Ridge, you have a view both directions. And then there's a lot of great farmland in our area. I mentioned a few, Pensdale, Cogan House, Jackson Township, Annie's Fort. That's where if you want to see things like harriers and kestrels, that's where you can go. Or look for snowy owls. So if you want to learn more about identifying things, about identifying rafters, I brought a couple of books you can take a look at if you want. Um, Hawks at a Distance and Hawks from Every Angle by Jerry Lake Worry are some of like the Bibles of raptor identification. Some other ones I recommend are Hawks in Flight, the Cross the ID Guide to Raptors. And there's also a new smartphone app, I have it on my iPhone, that is from Hawkwatch International. And it's got videos, it's got sound, it's got a lot of great pictures with captions. So that's a really good resource that just came out in the fall. But I'd say hawks at a distance and hawks from every angle are some of the best for hawk watching. Um, if you're interested in what we do with birds, there's a lot of good Facebook groups that you can join. We have our Lycoming Audubon Society one, which as of yesterday we had about 650 members, so we keep growing and growing. I run a Facebook page called Raptors of Lycoming County. There's two big um, raptor groups that are nationwide or worldwide. That's the Riff Raff Hawk Watch Group and Hawk ID. And there's also a Facebook group called PA Burgers, which is just people from Pennsylvania. So join us there if you're not there. You don't have to be a member of Audubon to join. 